Let's talk about shit for a change. <laughs> I have some old news for you. The world we live in today is made up of two populations. A population of haves and a huge population of have-nots. It's about 15% haves and 85% have-nots. The haves spend almost all day, we're all parts of the haves, right? The haves spent most of their time all day long looking for more things to have. The have-nots, they spend most of their day trying to get through the day. This, this has got to change. First of all, it's not fair. It's not moral. But from a practical point of view, it's not sustainable. The path that our planet is on, the path that we are on, has got to change. Over the next 20 years, another 2 billion people are going to join us on our planet. And 85% of them are going to join the have-nots. This is going to put huge pressure on our globe to supply water, food, energy, shelter. The thing is, who's training the young people of today to deal with the problems that my parents' generation created, my generation ignored, your generation and your children's generation to deal with. Well, not enough is being done. At the point we stand today, it's no longer an option. It's more like an obligation. Imagine, imagine that you could do something about the 1.2 billion people on this planet that don't have clean water to drink. Imagine you could do something to alleviate the pain of the 1.2 billion people that live on $1.2 a day. This next one is hard. Imagine you can do something about the 30,000 children that die every day for completely avoidable reasons. What if we could develop a society of positive change makers? People that knew how to use appropriate technologies, to go into a community and build capacity. People that would strengthen a community. I submit to you that if our young people can go into other communities and learn these skills that will only strengthen our society, our communities, and our country. I like to call these people global engineers. Now, please, don't get worried about the word engineer. We're all engineers. You are all engineers. We all want to engineer a better world. Okay, I'm an engineering professor and I've done the university thing for the last too many years. And I wrote papers that most people never read and I gave lectures <laughs> that many times people fell asleep in it and that's not going to happen tonight. <laughs> And I wrote proposals that more often than not were not funded. But the thing is, I had zero impact. Not on the world around me and not on my students. And that kept me up at night. That actually, I lost sleep because of this. And about 10 years ago, I decided that I was going to leave a mark. I was going to try to find a way that my students would light the path to positive impact. It wasn't simple. I had to think about what we were missing. What weren't we giving to our students while they were studying? What was happening to them as they were studying? And what did it mean when they left to go into the real world? I came up with three things that I had to deal with. A friend of mine says, the rule of three. So the first thing is, I was not putting what I was teaching into a social context. They didn't understand how what they were doing could actually change the world. Maybe what I'm really trying to say is that I believe that we should teach compassion and teach social conscience. Hands-on abilities. It's weird. I come from a very good technical university, but most of my students are technically inept. You ask your standard electrical engineer, we might even have some of them here, to open up a light switch, fear. I once saw a civil engineering major who had already finished the degree burst out in tears after paying $100,000 for university education and couldn't pour a slab of concrete. So tying hands-on abilities with social conscience 
can go a long way in developing the concept of community. I think and I want my students to be leaders. I I'm going to go out on a limb here and ask a question. From what professions do the leaders in our society come from? Lawyers, Lawyers. Journal Journal journalists, General. generals. I have a friend that calls them the G's and the J's. No. Journals, <laughs> economists, what you say? Art I wish we had more artists. <laughs> but you know what? I think what you guys have done is equated between leadership and politics. It, it's not the same thing. If our politicians were leaders, the world would look a lot better today. <laughs> leadership is synonymous to change. Leaders initiate change, they drive change. And I think leadership can be taught. Why aren't there more doctors, biologists, anthropologists, engineers taking on leadership roles in society? I don't know. I'm working on it. Why in academic institutions are we always bogged down with transferring knowledge? What about initiating change, causing impact? And this, there's a problem here because to implement this type of concept means to cause change. I have a very close friend, his name is Bernard Amadei, who says the only thing that really likes change is a wet baby. <laughs> so when I started thinking about how am I going to explain to the management of my university what I want to do, I had to think of a language that they would understand. And I would probably have to hide that word, change. And it turned out to be pretty easy. It's actually quite simple. <laughs> GE is a global engineer. CE is, no, a conventional engineer. And Delta E SUP is going to be some supplement that I want to give these students. Notice I never used the word change. Engineers Without Borders is the platform for this, for this change. It brings together mentors, engineers, students from all realms of study, and tries, to give them, and tries to give them a platform to build capacity in developing communities around the world. At the Technion today, we have about 100 students active in, in these activities. We have three partnerships. A partnership in Ethiopia, a partnership in Israel, and we have a partnership in the eastern tip of Nepal, in a small village called Nam Saling. Five years ago, we sent two students to do a participatory community appraisal with the people of the village. I'd like to tell you some numbers. A thousand families live in Nam Saling, four to six people per family. These people live on less than $1.2 a day. Almost all of them live by sustenance farming, most families will have two cows, a pig, a buffalo. Remember the stuff about the animals, we'll come back to that in a second. No electricity, so they cook, light, heat their houses by burning wood. Meet Indira. The women carry the wood, 40 kilos a day, two and a half hours of brack baking work. No sanitation systems. Many houses don't have toilets. The sewage from the animals, the sewage from the humans in the house, finds its way quite easily into the water system, which means the water is bad. Unless you boil the water, which means you have to collect more wood. You know the story, there's a hole in the bucket? It's, it's worse than that. Who then takes that wood and prepares the meal and boils the water? The women. It's always the woman. And the Nepali woman has 30 times, that's not 30%, 30 times, that's 3,000% the chance to become ill with some form of respiratory disease. So when you put all this stuff together, all these issues to deal with, 
They are the most basic issues of human life. It's about health. It's about the quality of life. And it's about our environment. And these are difficult issues to work with. But what astounded me is what happened when my students worked on this. And they looked at the root causes for each and every one of those six bubbles on the drawing. And they realized that the common root was the lack of clean energy. And from that point on, it was simple for them. Find a cleaner energy source. And they decided to implement household biogas reactors. A biogas reactor is a circular cylinder in the ground that we fill with organic material. Don't get all squirmy. I, it's shit. <laughs> but each and every one of us has our own personal bioreactor. <laughs> and every once in a while, we hear it. <laughs> it turns out that if you feed this bioreactor about 50 kilograms of fodder, which is basically organic materials a day, it will reward you with five to six hours of cooking fuel a day, methane. There's actually another upside to this thing. The slurry, the sludge that comes out of the reactor is full of nutrients, so it's perfect for preparation of organic fertilizer, and we, we heard uh, some more about that today, and this is a perfect combination. So nutrients for fertilizer go, go, going in here. Where's the 50 kilos of fodder coming from? Anyone know how much a good cow will give a day? I'm not talking about milk. <laughs> how much? 15. 15 is a, a Nepali cow. An Israeli cow will give you 30. They eat better. But between the cows, the pig, and the human element, that's going to go in there too, you can easily get 50 kilos of organic matter for your reactor. Easy. And you can run this reactor. And the students, not only did they decide to build these reactors, they came along with an ingenious way to make it easier to build. They used materials that are found locally, bamboo, everything was found close to the village of Namsaling. They put these pieces of bamboo that looked like huge sushi mats onto this metal frame. Each sushi mat went onto the frame, that's what the frame looks like when it's all covered and then it gets covered with concrete. The beautiful thing about this concept is that they can now slip in underneath the concrete after it's set, take apart the frame, take apart the sushi mats, go off to someone else's home, and build another reactor. Remember Indira? This is Indira a month after we installed her reactor. It's the first time she's cooked anything that wasn't on wood. The outcomes here have been huge, huge. We've so far built 62 such reactors. Hopefully, by the start of this summer, we'll be up to 102. I want you to understand... I would like you to understand what it means to a family to have a reactor like this. On average, each family that has a reactor like this saves 12 tons of wood every year. That's 12 tons less wood burnt, 12 tons less trees cut down, and a whole lot of particulate media that would be going into Indira's lungs. It has turned a waste product to a commodity. Instead of letting the manure go into the water, the household manure and the animal manure gets put into the reactor. It cleans up the water. Two hours every day are saved on backaching work. Fertilizer is being created in a very organic, organic foods in Nepal are also becoming big. A co-op for building bioreactors is being planned by the Community Development Center to build bioreactors in, oh, in, in the nearby communities. The beauty of this situation is that it's a holistic approach. It doesn't actually solve maybe anything, but it addresses many things, and that's the beauty of this type of situation. Last point I want to bring up. We almost lost contact with what we wanted to do. It was about the students. How do I empower the students? How do I train them to become leaders? How do I promote them to have impact? 
The students came through this process with a heightened sense of compassion, a heightened social conscience. Each and every one of them has picked up the torch. John spent a year in Haiti after the earthquake. Tom built a workshop in his community he works in. Hannah works for the Paris Center of Peace, doing projects all over Israel. A strong sign, a strong community, goes out and helps its neighbors. It builds capacity, and I promise you, if we go out and build capacity, the young people of our society will come back and make our society stronger. This concept is infectious. It's powerful. Each and every one of us has the power to initiate change. But only if we do it together can we make change sustainable. The Nepali word namaste means my soul touches out to your soul. Please, go touch somebody's soul. Namaste. Thank you.